My name is Anthony Caruana. I'm a priest in uh, two Edinburgh parishes called St. John Vianney's and St. Gregory's. So I visit some countries in, in Europe and I've also visited uh, Guatemala and East Africa to experience mission work and also Cameroon as a deacon where I did my first baptisms and I've been to various World Youth Days as well um, including Brazil and Spain. In my opinion what people can learn from traveling is to put their own culture into perspective because if we're just surrounded by our own culture um, we take that as the norm and we don't realize how other people live life and perhaps how they would see what is normal to us as not so normal. Uh, my childhood was very happy. Um, both uh, our parents were so, so loving and, and devoted to our family and I have a younger sister as well who is also lovely. I'm not sure she'd say the same about me but um, a big thing growing up was football so my father played for a local football team and even managed it and so I also wanted to be very good at football. So we also had um, something called like uh, catechism class, like doctrine class, and we all went, but we really only went to play football. <laughs> so yeah, that was a big part of my, of my childhood. That's what we spent doing, especially in the summer holidays, was, was play football. So it was at that age too that I developed um, my love for Manchester United which was passed on from my, from my dad. So, yeah, my childhood was, was great. It was really happy. So, so it, it goes out, you know, from my own experience of Gozo, it's a beautiful island in the sun and um, very Catholic orientated, very faith orientated. What was it like as a teenager there, you know, with your friends, you know, growing up? Yeah, so you're right, Frank. Gozo has a, a strong Catholic heritage, um, but also the uh, the church and church groups are active at a very local level. So it's, you know, the church is quite a strong part of the social life of people as well. Um, so growing up in that, in that environment was a, a privilege because um, it wasn't so unusual to think about God or, or faith. So most people assume that God exists. Right. That's the sort of approach. Okay. So um, that was good too because uh, families are quite strong and, and close-knit because it's a small place. Right. So I had uh, friends from school and we, you know, we, we had a strong friendship and we, we've kept it going as well, even though we're in different countries. Lovely. So against that background then, it wouldn't have been a surprise to your friends when you announced that you were going to the seminary and going to uh, go for priesthood. So yeah, things that weren't quite like that, exactly. Right. <laughs> right. So, okay. Um, yeah, I, in many ways, my, my teenage years were, uh, were normal, um, but I had to, started to feel an attraction to, well, first of all, it was an attraction to, to the Christian life at a slightly deeper level. That developed into an attraction to, to the priesthood. So I was going to prayer groups and that sort of thing to, to help me understand better. Yeah, basically one, one day when I was 17, there was a, a Good Friday celebration in our village and I had been speaking to the parish priest and he suggested to me that this was the right time for me to, to put um, the vestments of an altar server on. So I turned up as an altar server and my friends were there and they couldn't really understand what was happening. Um, but then they joined the dots and they saw, you know, these meetings I was going to and now this was me um, feeling more prepared to consider the priesthood. Right. So that, that basically is the big question, you know, when, when you actually decided to actually pursue a role of priesthood. And, you know, was, was there an actual moment when you decided, yes, I definitely want to be a Catholic priest. I'd say there was, for me, a, a definite sense that I was growing. I, I could literally feel it, but I can't say there was a, a moment, per se. So when I when I was at, in primary school, I did not want to be a priest, particularly. It was more or less halfway through high school that I uh, this started to grow in me. 
Some particular influences were the, the parish priest at the time, who had a, a great love of working for vocations. So I think easily, sort of through his mentorship, there have been 30, maybe more priests. Right. Um, so I was one of those. Okay. Um, and he, so he took great care of those um, young men who, who perhaps were feeling a, a vocation. And he would uh, gather us every week and we would pray together and discuss issues together. Um, and then twice a year he would take us on retreat. Mm -hmm. And for me those were the, the big highlights of my vocational journey. Uh, because I could spend uh, time in, in quiet to, to pray. So I, I, I felt that spiritually I really thrived in, in those retreat moments and so on. So you uh, went into seminary in Gozo? Yes, so I was 18. When I finished high school, I went, I went to seminary. So I was, I was guided throughout by a spiritual director as well. I think one of the good advice uh, that I was given was to, to have a spiritual director. So I think I was only 13 or 14 when I started. And so he, he guided me practically to, to take that step. Okay. And then he was also the spiritual director in seminary. Right. So. Um, he, he mentored me throughout that, okay. that process as well. So yeah, I was 18 when I started seminary. Um, so we were about 20, something like that. Okay. Um, and we all already knew each other because it's such a small place. Right, okay. Um, so it was a great environment in many ways because we were all young and we all played football. That was really the highlight of our week. <laughs> um, and um, there are some important lessons that I I learned there. The director in particular was very keen on something called Lectio Divina, which is how, how to pray and reflect on, on scripture. Right. Um, I've retained that really as my, my um, basis for my own prayer life. Um, and something else that was very interesting, I think it was a bit ahead of its time. Um, we had, there was a lot of emphasis on human formation, so we had to do counseling once a week. So. Some people associate counselling with maybe some kind of problem or issue, but for us it was just uh, learning better who we are right. as an individual. And I, now I can see how much sense it makes because you can't really help other people unless you first understand yourself. Absolutely. Um, so I'm very grateful for, for what I was given in those, in those years yes. in, in the seminary. Right. So it was a very nurturing experience uh, in the seminary. The, did you actually have moments of doubt? Certainly before joining seminary, I, I did have big moments of doubt. Um, then again, I was so young. <laughs> um, I suppose the biggest doubts that I would have had were around um, married life. Um, because I felt attracted to the priesthood, but I felt attracted to married life as well. And they're both gifts, aren't they? They're both good things. and that's. That's the hardest choice when you have to choose between two good things. Absolutely. So at what stage in the seminary did you decide to come to Scotland? Yes, yeah, so as, as I mentioned, this island that I come from is, is so small. Uh, it's beautiful, but it's small. So it's recognised that as part of the formation, um, seminarians spend a year overseas, um, normally involved in, in parish work, but we were also encouraged to, to, to take on a job. So, um, through a contact that I had, I, I came to Scotland and it was to this very parish right. um, about 13 years ago. So I did uh, various uh, activities in the parish, especially in the school. Um, and I also had a job as a waiter. Mm -hmm. So that's how I came to Scotland and I, I was so happy with that experience because it was very balanced. I, I got the experience of the church in Scotland, but I feel I got a little bit of experience of life outside the church in Scotland. It was like as if you had two callings. One calling to the priesthood and one calling to Scotland. Yeah, I, I've, I see it in that way that um, it's, it's a vocation within a vocation. So uh, the vocation to the priesthood, but then the vocation to leave my country and serve here in Scotland. So. Right. You know, that leads us then to your ordination, you know, and your first mass. You know, there must have been very joyful occasions, having gone through the ups and downs and the in-between, 
you know, of seminary life to actually then, you know, present yourself for ordination. Yes, yeah, so after my, my time in Scotland, I spent uh, five years. Uh, I was sent to the Scots College in Rome because that's where Scottish students um, are, are prepared. Um, and then the ordination was back here in Edinburgh at the cathedral. So yeah, that was a, a very joyful occasion. I was so happy that even my family encouraged me to have my ordination here. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it was an excuse for them for a holiday. But they, <laughs> they came over and yeah. I remember when they arrived at the airport, everybody on the same flight. So there was a very big group. Um, and I really felt very supported and um, you know, full of energy for, for the big day. So. And then you went back to Gozo for your first Mass and it must have been so joyful for your family and your friends and your, the whole island actually. Yeah. Yes, so in, in, in Gozo there's a, a big tradition of celebrating um, what's called the first solemn Mass. Um, yes, yeah, so it's, it's a very happy occasion and um, there was even, you know, like a, the local band accompanied my family up to the church. Right. It was that, that sort of thing. And the whole village really participated. That's wonderful. Um, so, you know, they were in many ways letting go of me, but they were still happy because they were giving a priest to the, to the global church. That's wonderful. And I, I, I get the impression from you that, you know, whilst you loved your experience in the seminary in Gozo, that you felt you wanted to actually broaden your horizons and uh, really find out more about the church on the missionary scale. So going to Rome, you know, could you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Because you must have met a lot of international students there, you know, and, and started to see the bigger picture of the global church as you call it. Yeah, that's right. I think even from when I was young, I've had a, a desire to explore, um, explore different countries and different cultures and so on. Um, so when I, when I came to Scotland, uh, you know, there were many things that I started to, to recognize. So for, uh, for example, just a simple fact that um, the church here isn't, um, isn't, a, isn't dominant. You know? It's yeah. a quieter presence. And also the role of priests is different in some ways. Right. Um, so in Rome, yeah, I met many students and, and people from many countries because we studied with the, with the Jesuits at their university and so the, the students were from many countries. Right. Um, so I started to listen to their stories as well. Um, so I think I learned a lot from that. So um, I also tried my best to, to visit countries which are quite different from the ones I'm used to and to see what the church is like there. Right. So my first trip was to, to Guatemala in Central right. America and I spent a month with a, with a missionary there. Um, so that was a great experience to see the, the faith celebrated in perhaps in simple ways, but with, with great joy, with great conviction. Um, of course, at the same time, I could see the hardship of daily life. So right. that was also something new to me and a bit of a shock. It, it, it ties in quite a bit with the message of Pope Francis, you know, the, the, to actually bring the church into simple focus and yeah. to walk with the poor. Yes, I, I would say so. My, my, five, my five years in, in Rome as a seminarian, um, there, was, there were these great benefits of meeting people from all these different countries. Um, but I also saw that side of the church which is often criticized, and that would be the, the fact that we are um, considered by some to be a, an institution and you know you, you do see signs of that in, in Rome obviously um, but I learned from all these different contacts that the church uh, isn't an institution it's, it's a family um, the church has an institution because it's a global organization um, so for me that was a, a big lesson and it it helped me a lot to be strong in my conviction and also it helps me in the way that um, that I approach people, especially those who are maybe not Catholic or, or have doubts and so on. So all that experience has really enhanced your role as pastor here in St. John Vianney Parish. Could you maybe 
sort of um, share with us, you know, the work that goes on here, initiatives, um, and, you know, it's seen the fruit of the gospel, you know, in this vibrant community of St. John Vianney. Very much so. So, in my life, I've met so many lay people who are committed and, and really, really competent. And I see in that the, the, the gift of, of priesthood, because as baptized people, we're all priests of Christ. Um, and Jesus asked us to be, uh, to go and make disciples. So in, in my congregation, I, I'm so lucky and I recognize that there are um, disciples okay. uh, who, who want to follow Jesus, but also want to lead others to be disciples. So, um, yeah, in concrete terms, the way we, we try to um, manage and promote the, the pastoral work of our parish um, is very much based on the gifts of our lay people. So, for example, the, the pastoral council which organizes the parish life is, is elected by the congregation. And that gives a sense of ownership and in, in the decision making as well. And something else that we've been working on a lot in our parish is something called stewardship. So um, stewardship, the way we see it, is um, a, a Christian lifestyle. And it starts with simply acknowledging the great gifts that God has given us. And then committing to, to use some of those gifts, whether they're our time or our talents or even our treasure, um, to build his kingdom. So to, to proclaim the word of God by, by word and by deed. So could, could I ask you what you would see as the challenges, you know, within the parish and within the archdiocese, you know, of, of being a parish priest? Yes, I suppose some of the challenges that we face as we try to bring Jesus are set by the culture or by society. Yeah, I feel that in, in some ways we are, we are blinded, so we, we, we are programmed to pursue happiness, aren't we? Um, but I observe that many people end up pursuing wealth or pleasure or something like that. But the, the true way of pursuing happiness is by, by pursuing Christ. So that's the biggest challenge that we face in ministry is to, to, to break through that, that blindness in a way. So, you know, to, to reach out to those who are lost for whatever reason. As, as a priest, you know, because when you, you think of um, aspects of justice, you know, it comes to fruition there. And of course, justice is very much part of the Christian message. It was in Jesus' ministry. It was, you know, when we read, you know, the, the, the workings of the uh, prophets like Amos, it's full of uh, aspects about justice. So, you know, hope and justice and peace must have come to the forefront for you when you were out there. Could you maybe share a little bit about that? Yeah, so I, I did some further studies in biblical theology. And so it was always my dream to actually visit the land where all these things took place. So, yeah, I went to the Holy Land for, for a month. And my main objective was to, to deepen my, my knowledge of scripture. So I'm sure I did. But um, there was a lot, of, a lot else going on, in, and it's going on in the present. So it's very humbling sometimes to see how, how hard some people have to, um, have to endeavor to, to truly live their, their faith, to live values such as for forgiveness in their daily life. I did sense the holiness of the place, and sometimes you also sense the, the conflict um, amongst people of different faith or amongst different Christians even. Um, but it was a, a great experience and one that I'm still trying to, to unpack. We have, um, all of us have certain saints that we find inspiring. Could, could I ask you, do you have saints that you find inspirational? I suppose some people would define saints as people who have died and gone to heaven. Um, but of course you have to live as a saint to, to be or to become a saint. So I like to focus a lot on the saints that I meet in my everyday life. Um, you know, people who are living the joy of being a Christian, 
sometimes in very small ways, but sometimes in bigger ways. Some of the saints that have inspired me amongst the traditional saints would be uh, St. George, um, who, who died as a martyr. And I was inspired by his courage and also for the fact that he stood firm and he, he chose Christ above everything else. And I remember also as a child being really inspired by, by John the Baptist. So I think also there was his, his fearlessness and the simplicity of his, of his life, that he was not um, trapped in, in any way by, by worldly possessions. And um, of course, as a, as a priest, as a parish priest, I enjoyed the protection of St. John Vianney, who is the, also the saint of our parish. So St. John Vianney is, is uh, important to me because there's also that simplicity in his life and his complete devotion to his people. It's interesting how you, you've chosen um, St. John the Baptist because he is the patron of hospitals and doctors and nurses and you in your chaplaincy role. It's interesting how that has emerged. Yeah, so apart from my work in the parishes and in the schools, I'm also a, a chaplain to the Royal Infirmary, which is one of the major hospitals in our city. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure that John the Baptist is with me because some of the situations that um, I'm called to encounter can be so challenging and there's there's no way anyone can, can train you for, for a certain situation. And as, as a chaplain, of course, you're walking with people who are very ill uh, and in very vulnerable situations. So if I was to ask you then about um, uh, youth, you know, and, and uh, some youth, uh, thinking of following the vocation of the priesthood, what message would you say to these young people? I think for all Christians, particularly for, for every young, young person who has faith in Christ, the time and the energy spent trying to understand what God is calling you to is, is never wasted. Um, whatever that calling may be to, it might be to, to the priesthood, it might, it might be to lay ministry, to marriage, it could, can be anything. I suppose one of the biggest seeds of doubt that I had when I was discerning was to not believe that I was made for more. Um, or to not believe that I was good enough. So, yeah, my, my, my message to young people would be to, to believe that you are called for more and to believe that, that you can be good enough um, if, if, if you're truly open to God's love in your life. Father Anthony, I want to thank you for sharing your compelling journey and for you know, sharing your personal experiences of priesthood and, you know, give you surprises to cherish and um, keep you strong in your faith um, and keep all of us strong in our faith. So thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom um, World TV coming to Europe and coming to England, that's fantastic, so that we can get the message of the good news out to people. I think many, many people of all ages, particularly young people, are searching. They're looking to hear a message in their language in a way that they can understand. And good Catholic media can serve that wonderful purpose of getting that news out there and encouraging and challenging people to find out a little bit more of the story of Jesus, which sadly so many people do not know or have forgotten. So it's great to hear this good news of Shalom World TV coming to the UK. May the Holy Spirit shower his blessings upon your work and your ministry in serving evangelization and the spreading of the good news of Christ. Shalom World, God's own channel.